Hi there, I'm Fiona from IELTS with Fiona and today I'd like to welcome you to another vodcast. What's a vodcast? Well, it means that you can watch this on YouTube if you prefer so you can see the things that I'm referring to or you can just listen listen along to this podcast and I'm going to talk you through a few of my daily tips and I also just wanted to thank you for your support. I noticed for the first time in three years I've actually got 2,025 listeners. It's been 2,000 for as long as I can remember. So thank you very much for that. Anyway, let's crack on. Um, This week a few new things. I finally published my blog about vocabulary lists. So that should be on the front page of the website when you go now. And if you want to find my daily tips, just click on the what's new in the menu and you'll find them in the sidebar. If you're on my email, you'll also get a weekly review of the tips. So yeah, this week I finally wrote a blog I've been wanting to write for so long all about vocabulary lists for IELTS. I just wanted to get advice from a a true expert. I mean, I know what I think, but I always look for evidence. That's what I tell my students to do. I think if you make claims when you go to university and you write your academic essays, you have to do the research, you have to find the evidence. So there's no point me saying, oh, I think you should learn my word list from the vocabulary course if I can't really back it up with evidence about why I think my word list is good. So I think mine is good because I've put together the words I've collected over about 20 years of reading and listening texts and I I just see these words coming up again and again and I think they're really important for for passive knowledge. Um, When I spoke to, oh, let me introduce Sheldon Smith, by the way. If you don't know him already, he's got a website called eapfoundation.com. Just go to that website and you'll find a lot more in-depth articles and information about what I mention on the blog. Um, He really knows things like about things like frequency lists. So I, I was given one of my lovely students said, Fiona, is this list any good? And when I looked at it, it was it was just awful. And I think it's the first list that comes up on Google and it's called the best IELTS list in the world. And the vocabulary is just truly awful. It's, you know, where is the evidence to say that students should learn this? And it really worries me. It it disturbs me because I think millions of people are looking at this list and thinking, oh, well, it must be good. It's first page on Google and trying to learn this, this rubbish language. So we need more evidence. We should be using good lists. And if you go to this blog, he talks about three or four key lists and they might not be what you're expecting. You guess, I guess you probably know about the academic word list and and that's another one I recommend. But he actually says, you know, there's possibly better ones. There's a general service list called a GSL and academic vocabulary list, academic collocation list and, and all of those links there are on this blog. Uh, How to use word lists for IELTS is there and it kind of just basically tells you what to do with them as well. So anyway, go and check that out yourself. I'll come back to it later in a podcast, I think. I'll do a full blog about it then. So coming back to my main goal today and that is to look at a variety of my daily tips starting from this time we're on February the 1st. So if you want any of my earlier ones, just go and look at an earlier podcast. So the first thing on February 1st was uh, something I saw on Facebook. I liked the the expression food for thought. Um, So the meaning, you can guess, 
You might say it when you want somebody to think about something. You might say, ah, well, that's food for thought. That, you know, that's something to think about. If you're British, it's probably a way of avoiding um, maybe committing to something like, yeah, okay, I'll think about it. But in, in this blog, it it was a nice thing about how, how to support local businesses. One of my, I, I support a, a yoga instructor who's a local one. I know I could get it cheaper on an Apple app, but, you know, she supported me, so I support her. And that's what this blog was all about. It said food for thought. And I thought that's that's a nice idiom. On February the 2nd, I noticed people doing this a lot is somebody might say, are you hungry? And the other person will use a synonym and they'll say, yeah, I'm a bit peckish. My son said to me, oh, I'm, I'm starving. And I said, yeah, I'm a bit peckish too. So peckish is a nice informal, uh, maybe slang word. It's not rude, it's slang. And there's even a bird food company called Peckish because it's a kind of pun on the word peck, which is what birds do. Um, yeah, so if you're peckish, you, you want to eat something. But it's, it's generally people might say, oh, it's really hot, isn't it? Yeah, it's boiling. So it's, it's just a way of acknowledging the other person or a little bit chilly today, isn't it? When you meet somebody in the street. <laughs> Chilly today? Yeah, it's freezing. And it's just a, a, a kind of a nice chatty way, I think. But I love the word peckish anyway. Then let's go to the third. Oh, the third. Yes, I was listening to one of my lecturers talking and he said, oh, I think they'll probably fail. I ha Have I told you about this one before? I can't remember. Anyway, um, instead of saying they'll probably fail, he said, oh, there's a high risk of failure. And I thought, wow, that sounds so good. There's a high risk of failure. Why does that sound better? Well, lots of reasons. And I've got a few blogs about what makes your language more academic. One of them in this example is that there's no personal pronoun. So, in, you know, if you said it normally, you'd say they'll probably fail. Um, and then the other thing is that you're using the noun form failure. Nominalization is a way of making your language sound more academic. And what of, often goes with the noun form is the expression there is. So there is a high risk of failure is, is very important and more flexible way of saying um, I think they'll probably fail. I talk about there is a lot in the Members Academy when we do feedback. There's a tendency when you're describing graphs to say things like female teachers increased significantly if you're talking about the number of female teachers. So that's around the band five or six mark. But if you say there was a significant increase in the number of female teachers, then you've immediately gone up a band because you're using the noun form and the there was and the past tense and it just elevates your language. So um, there's a high risk of failure. And, and interestingly, in the speaking class, we talked about how to use expressions with likely. So there's a likelihood that they will fail. There's a strong likelihood or they are likely to fail. And another word we, we noticed was they are bound to fail. I don't think they often teach that in course books. They are bound to fail. Um, the next one is all about flagging. I trained for a half marathon in February, which I do from time to time, because if I've got a goal, then I work towards it. If I don't have a goal, I don't run. And that's why I, I always think it's it's really important that you write down your goals or you have a, a set time frame. And that's why I don't give lifetime membership in the academy, because if you have lifetime membership, you'll you'll delay, you'll put it off. 
So I always give myself a goal to to run so that I know that I will do it. And I pay, of course. If I pay to enter, and sometimes it can be about £40, then I'm not going to waste that money. I'm going to work towards it. So it's another reason why paying for something helps you achieve your goals. And while I was running, uh, a woman said to me, I'm starting to flag. I'm flagging. And it's quite a nice expression, I think, when you're running out of energy or enthusiasm or getting tired. I thought it was nice for maybe storytelling in your speaking test. You could say I was starting to flag, so I stopped for a coffee. Another one you could do is I was feeling a bit peckish, so I stopped for something to eat as well. On February the 7th, I was ranting again about the don't say or stop saying posts um, that get these thousands of views. So this one said, don't say I'm from. That's ridiculous. Don't say I think. Don't say I agree. And don't use so. And I just wanted to make a point. You, I'm sure you know this because you are educated people, that it's absolutely fine to say all of those so very often when people try these lists of don't say that, they, they give you a word which just doesn't work. This one example said, don't say but, say nevertheless. Well, nevertheless isn't the same as but. You can't say I don't like coffee, nevertheless I like tea. It just sounds weird. So anyway, don't force your language. Just use what you hear. On February the 8th, we looked at an example of inversion, which is really useful for formal writing. There was a quote here from a Welsh rugby player, and he said, Rarely have we gone into the championship as favourites. Rarely have we gone. So notice what happens if rarely the negative word is at the start. It's like the same with never. Never have I ever done this before. So rarely have we gone. And this is a quite formal written structure, but useful. So normal word order would be Wales have rarely been the favourites. Rarely have Wales been the favourites. Then when we come to February the 9th, I've been trying to help my students in the speaking test and I've noticed that what I've been telling them more than anything is slow down. So a lot of people think fluency is speed and it's not. Fluency is about speaking naturally and using logical connections and If you watch any of those TED talks or somebody presenting, speaking very well, you'll notice they don't really speak very fast. And we did a little bit of research in the Members Academy. We counted, we recorded ourselves speaking and we counted the number of words and then we compared it with these TED talk speakers. And one thing we found quite useful was using the presenter coach which is a a powerpoint app or or it's part of powerpoint you you can just click rehearse with coach and i did an example i was speaking quite slowly but this was considered to be perfect it said 125 words a minute is perfect so why don't you try that out see how many words a minute do the two minute long turn and use like a voice recognition software, even Google Voice, something like that. Or or try out Presenter Coach. There's a YouTube video there that can help you use it. And let me know how you get on. Uh, February the 10th, my birthday, was a really common mistake. I think it's a first language interference mistake. And People have a tendency to say, I practice sport, but the collocation with sport is not practice. So it's do, go or play, depending on the sport. So you do yoga, aerobics, pilates, ballet, judo. You go swimming, running, play tennis, football, cricket. If you're training to get better at something, you practice 
but it's very specific and focused. So you practice the piano, practice your, your speaking. And the dictionary definition is to perform an activity repeatedly or regularly in order to acquire, improve or maintain proficiency. So if you play tennis, for example, you may need to practice your serve. If you go skiing, you may need to practice your jumps, but you don't practice sport, you, you do sport. There are other things you can practice, for example, a religion and medicine. Um, February the 11th, can and should. I talk about this a lot in task two. And the question was, some people believe the government should take care of the poor and disadvantaged in society. To what extent do you agree or disagree? Now, if I read the two sentences, which one shows your opinion strongly? Number one, politicians can introduce policies. Or number two, politicians should introduce policies. Well, for me, number one, can, is just a simple fact. They have the ability to. But number two is your opinion. You think that they should do more. They should introduce policies to create jobs. And, and therefore, I recommend most of the time you should be using should rather than can. On February the 12th, we were looking at bar charts or graphs and it was about the total annual hours of sunshine for London, New York and Sydney. And when I looked at the model, I found a nice um, verb that you could use in task one and the verb is to average. Um, Sydney's hottest weather is in December when temperatures average 25 degrees. It, it's it's a really nice it's a verb it, when instead of saying when temperatures are about 25 degrees you could say temperatures average 25 degrees so it might sound strange because you you maybe know average as an adjective um you know the average age for example but but here it's used as a verb and Imprecise language is really useful for describing trends. You don't always have to say exactly like in this one. It's got total hours of sunshine, 2,535. 2, well, why not say just over 2,500? It, it just way, it's a way of rounding up or approximately 2,500. Sounds much better than using the numbers every time. Um, on the 14th of February for my birthday, I went to London to see a Van Gogh, Van Gogh, Van Gogh exhibition and I saw these posters everywhere and each poster had a different pun. Um, I'm not sure what is advertising, a cooking website or something, I think. And the, the word here was hangry. So hungry is called a portmanteau term. It's a mixture of two words. Can you guess what they are? If you're looking at the video, you probably can. So it's, it's that feeling of becoming angry when you're hungry. So you know when you get low blood sugar and you get a little ratty because you're hungry. There's a word for it called hangry. And I know it from the runner's world. When you've done a long run, you get rungry because you're hungry because you've run a, a lot. <laughs> anyway, so these portmanteau terms, oh, runger, that's right, hungry because you've been running, runger. And there's quite a lot of them that you probably know about, like brunch is breakfast and lunch. So when you have breakfast and lunch at about 11 o'clock. Uh, Rom-com, romance comedy, Brexit, of course, Britain and Exit, also commonly known as Brexit, because it is, and so on. Um, this even is a vodcast, which is a mixture of a podcast and a broadcast. 
actually, yeah, it came from iPod, didn't it? So a podcast came from iPod and broadcast as a podcast, like a webinar is a web-based seminar. February the 16th was another example of claptrap advice. You know my claptrap advice is crap language advice posts, meaning nonsense. So this one was all about although, and it said you don't say although, use all of these and all of these are wrong. If you can watch this video, you'll see what I'm talking about. I've put them into sentences and absolutely all 20 of them are wrong. So it says, instead of saying although, say admitting. So you could say, although I was tired, I did my homework, but you can't say admitting I was tired. You can't say albeit I was tired or despite I was tired. None of these work. Please ignore these awful lists. I hate them. February the 17th, we oh there's a video that you can watch on YouTube and it's a way of practicing articles a uh, an and the so just watch the video all you have to do is go to a Google Doc and find and replace a uh, an and the and it gives you an instant practice test it's it's really handy and useful. Um, February 18th was a false friend about pass a test. So I know in French, I think, um, pass a test means to sit a test or to take a test. In English, it just means, no, it means you succeeded. I said all of my general training members passed their IELTS test. So now I don't have many general training students. And the French speaking student said, but did they get the score they needed? Oh, this was Nadja, lovely Nadja. And I said, yes, they all passed. And then she said, I know they passed, but they, did they get a good result? And I said, ah, yes, they took the test, meaning they sat the test and they passed, meaning they were successful. So. But there's nothing wrong with mistakes. February the 21st is all about the importance of must-takes. Not mistakes, but must-takes. Another portmanteau term. Mistake is a mistake that you must take, a kind of mistake you must make in order to grow. And there was this lovely, uh, I don't know what it was, a social media post. It said, mistakes are expected. Good for past tense pronunciation here, the ED. Expected, respected, inspected and corrected. February 23rd is all about general statements. This is quite, I could do a whole blog on this. In fact, I think I have done. Um, my question is, where is the evidence? I always ask for evidence. Today, I, I had a chat with somebody on Instagram who disagreed with me about opinion essays and I said that's fine if you think that that's fine but just say why you think that and this person just didn't want to discuss it and I just think if you're gonna put something on social media that you think is right you have to be able to give evidence about why you think it's right otherwise why are you teaching it so I always look for evidence with the word list, the vocabulary lists. I look for evidence that these are the words you should be learning. Are they high frequency words or low frequency? Um, so this was about educationalists, educationalists say every child should be taught to play a musical instrument. To what extent do you agree? In the Members Academy, we do research. We go and Google it. We look at news articles to show the benefits, the scientific benefits, the proven benefits of playing a musical instrument. The topic centers lots of people used. They said, nowadays, more and more children are learning to play a musical instrument. And I said, can you see any problems with this general statement? The purpose of a general statement is to give background information about the subject before you focus on the question. And they are difficult to get right. 
They should be neutral and objective, not your opinion. They should be general enough to be indisputable so no one could disagree with it. It should be a generally accepted truth so that you don't need to give evidence. And it should be specific to the question. So the problem with the sentence above is that there's no evidence that more and more children are learning to play a musical instrument. So I could easily dispute it. I could say, actually, I've heard that the opposite is true, that children are losing interest in musical instruments because of their phones. So it kind of weakens your position and makes you a bit less reliable as a source. It's better to use a general statement that no one could argue with. Research has shown that learning to play a musical instrument is beneficial to ch children. Many children learn to play a musical instrument at school because it is thought to bring many benefits. Even if you say that, it is thought to bring many benefits. It's probably better than making a claim about more and more children are learning to play a musical instrument. Oh, February the 22nd, I was a day late. <laughs> it was, so I'm going to talk about the 23rd, but it was a special date. It was the 22nd of the 2nd, 2022. And it was a Tuesday, which is a really interesting pronunciation because lots of people say Tuesday, but the American transcript script says Tuesday. Tuesday. So we say Tuesday and they say Tuesday. And there's also Tuesday. There's a guy, uh, sorry, a professor, Dr. Jeff Lindsay, and he posts these marvellous things on Instagram about pronunciation. And even the Cambridge English Dictionary puts the ch pronunciation first. So how do you say Tuesday? Tuesday, Tuesday or Tuesday. Coming back to that question on February 27th, that question of did all children learn a musical instrument? When we marked it, and now I've got a double marker, the secret marker, who, who I, I call him Mark, because he marks, he double marks. So we did some research about collocations to use about playing a musical instrument. And this is what I was talking about doing research because it brings up so much useful language. So look at these expressions. So what does learning to play a musical instrument do? How does it help? Here are some things the articles said. It fosters self-expression, cultivates creativity, relieves stress, sharpens concentration, boosts listening skills, enhances social skills, improves comprehension skills, teaches perseverance, encourages teamwork, refines organisational skills and so on. There are about 20 there and I've got a whole video on YouTube about how to discuss effects and um, these are these collocations are really important. It's like the so what sentence. If you make a point, well, so what? How does it impact other people or the situation? Ah, right. Coming back to February 28th. Here's a, one of the videos that I shared from Sheldon Smith with the EAPfoundation.com. And what I love about his blogs is that they are based on research. And you can see what he says, research has shown that. And I, I recommend this expression, research has shown that. Um, because I don't like making up articles. I don't like it in writing when people say, an, an article in 2019 from Oxford University said, you know, um, the, the double marker also pointed out that we want to see your words. We don't want to see um, imaginary articles. So I recommend that you say research has shown. And again, you can go to my blog there, how to refer to articles in IELTS task two. But the reason I was talking about it was because um, Sheldon 
produced this uh, collocation video about physical health, really important for IELTS. I think I'm going to end there because that's the end of February. I'll leave the next podcast for March. So remember to subscribe on my website to get these tips in your inbox and go and subscribe on YouTube as well if you'd like to watch the videos every week. Thanks for watching. Bye bye.